Uh, I'm Jim McAdams. I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute. And I'm really thrilled to welcome back to uh, Notre Dame Miroslav Marinovich. Miroslav is one of our great friends. He's been to Notre Dame several times before. Um, and I'll embarrass you, uh, Miroslav, by saying, for me, he's one of uh, the people in the world whom I've met who's showed uh, true courage and conviction. And uh, if any of you have been to uh, the Catholic University of Ukraine and in Lviv, or Lvov, or Lviv, however you pronounce it on any given day, <laughs> uh, then um, I, I am sure um, you will see what a fine institution this is, a really heroic institution, for which uh, Miroslav is the uh, vice rector. Uh, Miroslav was, was uh, involved with, uh, well, one of the organizers of Helsinki Watch uh, Ukraine, many other dissident movements. Uh, he was a guest of the Soviet government for seven years in the Gulag. Uh, and uh, he then was five years in exile, is that right? Five according to the sentence and three years according to reality. According to reality, <laughs> which I think seven plus three, you know, was um, certainly I, I don't have what it would have taken uh, to, to be Miroslav in these circumstances. Uh, he is today uh, very, very well known in, in Ukraine as uh, somebody who has always stood by his commitment to democracy and human rights and also to Catholicism. So it's great to have you back, Miroslav. You'll talk for a while. And then we welcome your uh, questions. We'll have good discussion. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Uh, actually, uh, we, both our universities, are good friends also, not only personally, but uh, I would say that I feel a deep gratitude to the American nation in general because the Soviet system punished me for 10 years of, of the life. <clears throat> the, the American uh, country, oh, mm -hmm. my wife suggested that I speak loudly. <laughs> 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 So I am especially grateful to the American nation because this was a great comparison. I uh, spent 10 years in Gulag and I uh, later came uh, to the United States in 1996 and I was part of the program in religion and human rights at Columbia University. And it was opening doors, windows, and uh, 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 so I'm really thankful. Now, my title is uh, title of my lecture is Contemporary Ukraine Trans Transformation Under Fire. So let me explain a bit these terms. First of all, transformation or transition. From what to what? Uh, the starting point was the status of Ukraine as an almost unrecognized part, unrecognizable part of the former Soviet Union, hidden under the collective names Russians. Uh, both senior George Bush, the US president, and Margaret Thatcher, the UK prime minister, considered Ukraine as uh, like Texas in the U.S. or Wales in the U.K. <coughs> and several part, part of, of the country. Uh, the reason was simple. An un unknown country doesn't have a history, therefore doesn't have an identity, and therefore doesn't have a right of self-determination. Thanks God, uh, God had more wisdom than our earthly politicians and 
contemporary Ukraine was born in the ruins of the Soviet Union. Now let's clarify the point of desirable destination. <clears throat> it is a European country with developed democracy. So far, to some extent, is wishful thing. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's always good to have a, a perspective. It was exactly the message of the revolution of dignity that expressed it so picturesquely in the, in the year 2013-14 on, on the Maidan in Kiev. Maidan is a square in the other capital uh, city, and on this square, most protests took place in, uh, in during <coughs> our two revolutions. Throughout the history, as soon as Ukraine was in position to define its future, it attempted to restore its ties with Europe. Uh, Ukraine, of course, surrendered and may might surrender to a dictatorship for some time, but manifested their will to overcome the tyrants. See what happens to the last Maidan. The attempt of the then President Yanukovych to replicate the Russian authoritarian legislation in Ukraine cost him the presidency. So now under fire. Now on the, the term Russia is on our agenda. Uh, since the spring of the two year, uh, uh, 2014, Russia is leading in Ukraine a so-called hybrid war. The goal is multiple, according to my understanding and my, my colleagues. First, to punish Ukraine for its attempt to associate itself with Europe and to turn it back to Russia. Second, to make Ukraine bleeding every day. You no, don't notice that from your TV news. But I knew and, and I know that every day, including today, one or two soldiers are killed. So for us, it's everyday bleeding. And uh, it will happen according to Putin uh, as long as Ukraine persists in its uh, European orientation. Third point, to present the war as an internal civil war among Ukrainians and not be punished, I mean Russia, not be punished for breaking all possible international agreements including the Budapest Agreement that guaranteed Ukraine uh, in, in, uh, territorial integrity uh, as an exchange of um, uh, uh, nuclear power. <laughs> I, I forgot the name, okay. And then, uh, refusal to, 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 to keep the uh, nuclear power. power. Uh, the ultimate goal, because Ukraine is not the major goal of, of Putin's regime, the ultimate goal, goal of Putin's regime is to punish the West for alleged humiliation of Russia through the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. Putin was the first politician in modern times who used the formula we want to restore the glory and power of Russia. Nikita Khrushchev, the former USSR um, leader, developed the slogan, let us catch up with America and leave it behind. Vladimir Putin understands today that this is impossible. However, there is another way to make yourself equal to the United States. Not this way to raise our abilities, but to push America down. And uh, 
so to say, to undermine the strength of America, uh, to make uh, her as weak as modern Russia. This is exactly what Putin's team is doing now, in uh, using Ukraine as a starting point. Uh, many people in Ukraine understand that the best way to win the competition with Russia is to become a successful and therefore attractive democracy. This would ruin the main thesis of Putin that within Eastern Europe the only effective and successful order is that of Russia. So the competitive system might be very challenging and is challenging for Russia. Uh, many of us recall the philosophy of the post-war Chancellor Konrad Adenauer in the context of Eastern and Western Germany. The idea was to temporarily, temporarily accept the loss of territory of Eastern Germany and make Western Germany attractive for the Eastern one. And the same philosophy might work in Ukraine that we, we cannot conquer Russia in, uh, and take Crimea and Eastern parts of Ukraine back. But our goal is to make Ukraine as successful democracy as possible in order to become attractive for other, uh, for our rivals, for our antagonists in the eastern part of Ukraine and for Russians themselves. And I may say that a few uh, Russian journalists uh, decided that there is more freedom in Ukraine and moved to Ukraine and now work in different media. Now, um, let me make a sort of SWOT analysis uh, of different segments of the Ukrainian society. The country in general. The country is facing the same task as Israel. How to defend the nation and to remain a democratic country, a democratic state. Uh, so far, we succeeded in the major goal through the future uh, development, though the future development are not so clear. On the one hand, uh, there, is, there are big achievements of Ukraine in this sense, and in general, society is more or less calm. But Still, we have some people who would like to make the transition to the democratic country as short as possible. That is, to check the validity of the famous, famous Murphy's Law, the shortest, the shortest distance between two points is a downward spiral. <laughs> uh, the main tension in the society is between those who are modernized already and those who are psychologically and economically attached to the old soil style management of the country. I remember when Romano Prodi told us, you would be friends, you have to decide with whom you are, what country you want to build, and so on. Uh, yes, I understand, but the immediate answer can be given only in a totalitarian state. If you want to preserve democracy, you have to respect both orientations, both uh, remnant uh, ideologies, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's a rather difficult time. In Ukraine, as in every country in transition, many contradictory trends coexist. That's why many contradictory statements about Ukraine are partially valid also. Sometimes uh, you, you hear the, the, the statement that there is bad something in Ukraine. 
Okay, yes. And there is some positive development. Uh, the British analyst James Sher has observed an interesting contrast. I quote, Russia, but it is the uh, translation from Ukrainian into English again. Uh, Russia is a country with a strong state and a weak civil society. Ukraine is a country with a weak state and a strong civil society. This has at least two important consequences. Uh, First, the foreign governments usually deal, of course, with the official representatives of the country, which, unfortunately, is not, not the strongest part of Ukraine. Uh, and secondly, in Ukraine, the best way to improve the situation in government is to improve that in civil society, that way of, of influence. Slaves will live in a total dictatorship, while free, responsible people and will be governed by exemplary democrats. Okay. The society has to decide what they are. Uh, I have actually, that's what analysis of our president, government, and parliament, but it seems to me that I don't have uh, time to go so deeply into each uh, point. But let me say the, the, the following, just shortly. Uh, President Poroshenko hasn't, uh, he is the best, uh, the best of power five presidents, for sure. He's rather effective on the diplomatic level uh, and uh, free, uh, visa free access to the EU countries is one of his main achievements. But on the, one, on the other hand, he didn't uh, manage to transform the whole system of, of, of management of the country. Uh, I still, as a, the, the former dissident, I still feel something which remains from uh, the previous uh, times. He president, uh, personally, President Poroshenko is not uh, an authoritarian leader. However, there is the so-called path dependence syndrome. And it seems to me that uh, it may, becomes, may become his future curse. Uh, because uh, when he uh, executes his power, it's always easier to use the previous models than to find new ways of, of management. So this is the, the situation we are still considered as dangerous. <coughs> Uh, the government, led by Volodymyr Grossman, our prime minister, demonstrates positive dynamics, and uh, he managed not to play so big political uh, role and play games with the president Poroshenko. Uh, however, uh, the rich become richer, and the poor become poorer. And probably this is the responsibility of the government, at least to explain why it is going on in this way. Because uh, people do not understand whether this is some enemies in the government or this is a natural consequence of economic changes. <coughs> Parliament, uh, I must say that unfortunately, a new campaign started already, electoral campaign. We, we had an, an exclusive situation uh, because uh, we had a constitutional majority in our parliament. This is a dream for many parliaments. But the Ukrainian parliament used that only partially the benefit. Uh, 
I'm especially disappointed with the fact that the new electoral law has not been passed by the parliament. This means that the party building system has not been changed and the necessary political lifts have not been started. And we will see the same names and the same faces in the electoral bulletins. To preserve power, unfortunately, becomes more important than to transform the country. So we have, again, a combination of positive things and negative things. Uh, now, let me give you some picture of, uh, let's turn to society, but uh, let me start first from religion, a religious situation. First of all, we have incredible legacy of both the Maidans. Uh, Maidan, the year 2004, and the next 1314. There was incredible unity of the nation. Uh, all we lose logic was uh, concentrated on the uh, government, on the <coughs> president. So, it was incredible unity of the nation who stood in, in, in front of uh, the government. And a uh, great experience of mutual cooperation between different Christian denominations and different religions took place in Ukraine, especially during the last uh, one, uh, the last my time. Now, <clears throat> first of all, there was an incredible moment when uh, the monastery uh, gave a Saint, gave a Saint Mikhail uh, a monastery in uh, uh, Kiev, opened their doors for uh, young uh, protesters who were beaten by the police. So they found the shelter in this monastery. And I remember that at the beginning, the Maidan was rather reluctant toward priests, toward other uh, religious signs. But after that, the, the ancient the role of the church as a shelter was restored. And then after that, there was a huge cooperation between the Mayan and uh, the religious segment of society. Uh, of course, when I say unity, I mean, first of all, unity between all possible churches except for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriot. Because partially it takes the, the side of the Russian <coughs> Moscow, uh, Russian church. Uh, but uh, after the uh, last Maidan, mm, for the first time, uh, Orthodox dissidents <laughs> appeared in that ch church. The dissidents who want to establish, who don't, don't want to leave the church, but they want to establish a new model of the church. Uh, which is dialogical, open for other confessions. And I, I welcome the appearance of these uh, dissidents very much. Now we have a strong revival of Protestantism. There is a special tension between old Protestants in Ukraine and young uh, Protestants. Young are very open very concentrated on societal issues and very dialogical. I, I visited some place because they invited me and they knew very well that I am good Catholic, but, but it, it was very, very nice. We speak, nobody tried to convert me as it <laughs> always happened in the Protestant community of the old style. <clears throat> now, uh, Interreligious cooperation. <clears throat> During Maidan, there was incredible, there were incredible moments 
were Christian, uh, Jewish, and Muslim prayers sounded up. So it was really incredible. Some rabbi came, some uh, muftis, and, and so on. And we tried to, to keep, to preserve that legacy of Maidan, at least according to the, uh, to the reports of our Jewish colleagues, the level of anti-Semitism in Ukraine now is on the lowest point, lowest even in, in Europe in general. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, but also now, Crimea Tatars issue became very important in Ukraine. But when we speak about Crimea Tatars, we mean Muslim. We mean some elements of uh, Muslim, cooperation with Muslims. And uh, I may say that, uh, thanks God, uh, Crimea Tatars and the leadership and the nation in general is very pro-dialogical. And uh, they re reject any sign of uh, violent uh, resistance to, to the new uh, authority in uh, Crimea, and uh, it was my message to, to them that this is the only option for you. If you start some violent resistance, you will be taken to the shelf uh, uh, terrorists, Muslim terrorists, and you are finished. So this is the only option for you to keep the non, non uh, violent <coughs> non violence. And the, the, the last point in this religious field, uh, the concept of spiritual unity changed in Ukraine. Uh, before 1991, the, the, the national spiritual unity presupposes uniformity. Uh, one church or one confession and, and so on. Now, uh, more and more, the concept of unity in variety, of unity in diversity, is being applicable to Ukraine, and I'm very happy about that. This is very clear. Now, <clears throat> uh, civil society in general, I have a few minutes maybe. Uh, on the one hand, we uh, see the rays of some, uh, I would say, propensity for internal conflicts in our society again. I'm very, I'm very concerned about that. And by the way, Donald Tusk, the head of the European Commission, warned Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians recently, I quote, Today, I see the external enemy won't conquer you. You are too strong. However, you might be defeated by yourself. So that's a very good message for Ukrainians. So we have, on the one hand, incredible uh, legacy of unity at both Maidans. But now, when uh, they are not at the top of mountains, but go, go into uh, valleys, then there is mist, there is, everything is not clear, so now there is a possibility to, uh, for conflictual people to, to be more active. Uh, before the uh, revolution of dignity, I mean the revolution to, uh, to 20, uh, 13, 14, and Ukraine was the model of passiveness and despair. <clears throat> the revolution gave birth to the powerful volunteer movement that actually saved the army and saved the country in general uh, during the, the first month of the Russian aggression. This movement is still present and still powerful now. Let me mention the issue of corruption, because it's, you may read that in your newspapers. <clears throat> I didn't speak about it in the 
check the so president, government, and parliament, cross corruption penetrates the whole society. Uh, corruption, nepotism, misusage of power, all these are the so-called val the values of survival. By accepting these values, the society had long ago accommodated itself to the evils of the Soviet and post-Soviet systems. Of course, people understand that corruption is the bad habit. But one bird in hand is more attractive than two birds in bushes. <laughs> That's why <clears throat> uh, people still use corruption as a means to, to survive. Uh, the transit to the values of self-expression, I mean respect for dignity, freedom, justice, and so on, has been launched by the revolution of dignity, but never succeeded completely. Uh, ordinary people would welcome fighting corruption, but they would prefer it to begin with somebody else. Uh, especially with the most rich and most powerful uh, leaders. As long as this is not the case, the so-called corruption consensus will be reality of our life. So the struggle is more complicated than we predicted at, at the beginning. Finally, let me mention the reason uh, for my hope and optimism. And it is incarnated in youth. <clears throat> in February of this year, I organized the round table at the Ukrainian Catholic University and uh, invited about 20 young, successful men and women from all over Ukraine. I was interested in those uh, who have already completed some successful business projects or social programs their opinion in our society is normally underestimated. And I wanted to hear them and didn't want adult uncles <laughs> like myself to intervene and muffle their voice. The result surpassed all my expectations. In spite of certain regional differences, they stood on the same value platform they treasure democratic freedoms and justice. They don't need corruption for their survival. They live honest life and still are successful. Because for many people, to be successful means to live, to live uh, honest life and vice versa. Uh, to lose your chance if you are a live honest life. And uh, this is truly the Maidan generation, as we would uh, say in Ukraine. In short, a new generation seems to be formed in Ukraine that cannot be labeled as homo sovieticus anymore. For me, this is a moment of total ha happiness. <clears throat> but there is one uh, thing that is still lacking. They have no access to the decision-making process in the state management. And uh, my uh, so my happiness is con uh, combined with uh, some concern. They are not represented at the political level. Uh, and this is the generation of horizontal ne networking rather than of political verticals. They do not want to be dissolved in imperial parties. I respect that position. And I don't want to violate their identity. However, the problem remains. No political party represents the interest, their interest on the political mount of Olympus. If you know how to resolve this dilemma, please tell me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, students, we always begin with students who ask the first question. Yes. Uh, so, 
The issue of uh, European Union membership uh, is popular, uh, well contested in Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yes, uh, it was probably mo uh, most welcome at the beginning. It is still a positive idea for Ukraine, but the, the mood went down because nobody wants us in Europe. Because Europe has many internal uh, problems. They don't want to Deteriorate, uh, deteriorate the relations with Russia. And Russia is strongly against that, the, the membership of Ukraine in the EU. So we feel that we are a bit outside the, the, the court, in the court, outside the room. So there are some steps forward. And I don't want to criticize uh, uh, the EU totally. Because the uh, free visa free uh, access to Europe, some uh, preferences in economic ties. So there are certain steps, but definitely not joining the EU. Thank you for that question. Next question, Mr. Thank you. You mentioned uh, the failure of the government to make reforms to allow uh, new political people to be standing for election. It's the same. Oh, sorry, you, you mentioned that the, the, that the coming elections are going to be the same old faces, that there were no reforms made. Um, what's the main obstacle preventing young people from my own generation from forming their own party into standing for office themselves? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a rather difficult question, but uh, I want to correct the, 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 the phrase that no reforms were made. No, there were some reforms, very positive, very effective, but those reforms are not uh, visible by ordinary people. People suggest that there were no reforms. It's not correct that <laughs> there were uh, reforms. But still, uh, there is, uh, I feel, the old concept of power in the minds of our uh, political leaders. Uh, Quasi-Soviet, let's say. Uh, they are afraid of uh, pushing themselves into the free waters of democracy. They are afraid of, of that. They do not know how to survive uh, that and how to keep power in true democracy. So a new generation has to bring this knowledge and bring this new concept of power. But a uh, new generation wants to preserve its identity. Because if they go to, the, to these existing imperial parties, they just disappear as, as people with dignity, as people with some clear identity. I, I remember several public figures who were very visible in Ukraine, but when they entered this political party, they just disappeared. So uh, normal <laughs> uh, young people do not want to join uh, politics. But uh, they are not in solidarity in themselves, because of what you propose to organize its own, uh, their own party, presupposes that they may be in solidarity with each other, but they are spots, different spots in Ukraine, uh, spots of new life, which are not connected so, so much. I even uh, proposed to them at that uh, round table, do something, because I, I understand that umbrella organization doesn't work. But do something like uh, flash mob. Do some, not especially political, but some socially important act all together and show the government that you are important. <laughs> so that was my proposal. But maybe you know something, something else. <laughs> Another student. <laughs> Well, um, you spoke a lot about community during um, Chumaidans, and I remember 
forgive me, my memory is a little hazy now, and I haven't really studied this since undergrad, so it's been a while. Um, but I remember coming across a lot of surveys that showed um, a significant degree of uh, sympathy toward Russia, among Ukrainians even, a lot of just Russophilia in general. And so there was this evidence schism that you even mentioned in your speech. Um, and I wanted to ask, since 2014, have, has that uh, sympathy dissipated? And if not, um, if it has, what have been the, the factors that trend toward that dissipation? Has it just been the ongoing violence? Has it, has it been the population seeing what kind of effects this tension has caused? And if it hasn't dissipated, what are um, actions that either the population or the government or maybe foreign governments can take in order to lessen the schism um, and bring about a little bit more of the, uni uh, the unity that seems uh, would be beneficial for the country? I'm not sure that I understood Sorry, the last, the last minutes, point, so I apologize for that. but let me start with what I understood uh, probably properly. So uh, there is certain dynamic in Ukraine when we speak about Russian, uh, pro-Russian feelings. Uh, before the first Maidan, uh, the country was divided actually in two parts. Uh, pro-Ukrainian, pro-Russians. Uh, and we always read in uh, foreign newspapers that Ukraine is divided in general. The first uh, Maidan showed a picture that we uh, hate, uh, yeah, we love uh, Pushkin, but hate Putin. <laughs> so, uh, with this message, there was a, a clear message to the society that we do not, not want to uh, become anti-Russian by being critical toward the Putin administration. Later on, after, immediately after the, the Orange Revolution, it, now we understand that there was a, a clear program for Russia to bring Ukraine back and to develop some sort of political measures. And it was done successfully in Yanukovych. Uh, the president in Yanukovych just worked for this you know, the implementation of this uh, uh, model. But he uh, offended or touched the dignity of Ukrainian people. So that's, that's why the, the immediate reaction for, for him was to, to dismiss him. Okay, it happened, but then the Russian aggression immediately took place. And that shocked, really shocked, the pro-Russian segment of the Ukrainian society. Well, wait a minute, it's our brother. <laughs> it's our bro closest brother, and, and, uh, and there is war with, with Russians. Do, do we have to shoot in, in, in the Russian soldiers? That, that was really a big shock, shock for, for, many, uh, for many people. But later, these pro-Russian, not later, but almost immediately after that, after that shock, pro-Russian segments went to, to the army to defend Ukraine. So they didn't accept the concept, Putin's concept of Novorossiya, of the, all uh, uh, southern and eastern part of Ukraine. There was an idea that all, uh, the all Russian-speaking Ukrainians will join uh, this uh, new republic, republic immediately. No, it didn't, it didn't happen. And uh, some observers say that there are more Russian-speaking soldiers in the Ukrainian army on the front than Ukrainians. That, that's the certain dynamic. But um, it is very important not to follow the model of, the, of Putin wants to impose on us. Because what he does is clear zero sum uh, logic. Our victory means your defeat. Uh, 
what is best, what is the best for Russians, this is from, for, for Ukrainians and, and so on. I don't want hatred to be developed in Ukraine, hatred against Russia. I understand that when you shoot uh, to uh, someone, you cannot love this person. But it's important then to take hatred out of your body, of your soul, because it's impossible to, be, to build the, the good society on, the, on hatred. I was going to ask, um, uh, you speak about unity, and I wonder if you see, do you see unity as a goal of civil society, or as a goal of political Or? Or as a goal of political society. Do you see unity as a goal of civil society, or as a goal of politics? Um, this is, I would say, this is, of course, the unity of the society. And uh, there is a concept of that we want to be unity. Uh, all churches pray for 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 the, the, the gift to be in unity. Uh, but uh, because Ukraine is situated between two different worlds, it it always was the the, 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 the most difficult issue to preserve unity. So now we are uh, fulfilling this task. It's difficult, but not impossible. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for this, this very interesting talk. And a question, I want to come back to the issue that you talked about earlier about Ukraine's relationship with, with Russia. And I'm wondering, if you think about broadly the, the thinking of the political classes, Ukraine and in Russia. Now, what if, if you can see the political class broadly, so not just the current administrations, but all the people who somehow have a voice in politics, can you see a realistic path to a healthy relationship between the two countries? Uh, good question. I may see the realistic way, but only using my religious background, only using my religious faith. So I see that perspective uh, because so far, uh, so far the ideas of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy is not, uh, are not, these ideas are not consumed by the Russian society. So I would appeal to them to restore their attention to their own culture their own uh, legacy. But uh, our politicians do not think in this way. Uh, so, so far I'm not, uh, how to say, uh, of course I'm very critical toward the Putin's regime, and I may, may speak about that uh, uh, long, a long time, but uh, uh, I'm also critical toward the Ukrainian politicians. I do not think that they are able uh, to find uh, qualitatively new methods. Sometimes they a little bit overdo with uh, 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 heroism or fighting with Russians. Because, uh, as I told you, I, I am afraid of uh, this Windows logic. Uh, I'm in favor of win-win, but uh, so far uh, Putin does not uh, uh, doesn't give us a possibility to sit down and play this win-win logic because he wants us to to disappear as a, as a separate nation. So there is no 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 dialogue in in, in this sense. That's why it is so important that uh, Europe and the United States uh, apply the modern international principles to these uh, Ukrainian-Russian relations. Help us in, in this sense. Because uh, for the Putin, uh, 
Ukraine is a secondary country, it's not, it's a failed state, uh, under under state, uh, and so on. There is a clear parallelism, uh, by the way, between the, the period of World War II in uh, connection with Poland, and now in connection with Ukraine. I was shocked that, uh, hist um, when I read a historical document that Polish war, war was declared, Poland, the Polish state, was declared as a fascist state. First, it was openly published in the Soviet Union and understate, the failed state. So all these terms now are, <laughs> are applied uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, the, the nothing changed. The same logic. You don't have a right to exist. So there is no possible dialogue in this sense. So, um, what's your crystal ball say about the Eastern Ukraine and Donetsk in particular? What is that? How is that developing? What's the future there? And my second question is, we've had our own orange revolution here in the United States recently, as you know. And what will the impact of it be on the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship uh, going forward? But, uh, what would be uh, when, uh, what has to, to have some role in Ukrainian's uh, U.S. relations? The Orange Revolution. Oh, Trump. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so let me first answer the, the, the first one, and then you remind me as a second because I'm I already old. <laughs> uh, so uh, the. There was, and I'm sure that uh, there will be a certain dynamic when we speak about Eastern uh, Ukrainians. Uh, at the beginning, they shared the typical underestimation of everything Ukrainian, as it was the case in the Soviet Union. Uh, I forgot the Yekto Znebaha. Disregard. Disregard. Disregards. They disregarded everything in Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainian language, Ukrainian prospects for future. No, only Russia is a valuable, strong state. Uh, we don't want to be connected in any way with, with this old uh, 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 secondary Kievan uh, politicians. So I suspect that this, this was in the base of their attitudes that we want to be on with Russia. Russia will uh, incorporate us uh, into Russia as it was uh, with Crimea, and we will enjoy the happy life in Russia. It didn't happen. First of all, they are independent republics. And uh, for the second, uh, Russia didn't meet all their expectations. Uh, so they are now a little bit, they are still critical toward Kiev, but uh, they are not so happy with their ties with uh, Russia. Uh, now, the, what I said about Germany, Eastern and uh, Western Germany, is uh, uh, to some extent applicable to modern Ukraine, because some Ukrainians uh, who live in Donetsk, who didn't want to stay there under the Russians, they moved to Ukraine, uh, to Ukrainian territories, uh, and for the first time they understood that Ukraine is different than they uh, thought previously. They, they understood that they lived in a different culture, in a different, uh, uh, different mood. Let me give you just one, one example. Some uh, professors from Donetsk uh, come to, uh, came to the Ukrainian Catholic University. And after some conversation, we moved to the dining room. I was the first, I was leading 
this group, uh, this my food, and uh, sit down in the uh, hall. They stood and asked me, will you eat here? Said, yes, this is our dining room. But there are students here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, <laughs> there are students. And they put that, uh, no, this is impossible. You live in a different situation. <laughs> so I give you that. But they, they are just the, uh, exploring the new, new civilization in Ukraine now. And now they are more in favor of Ukrainian. Uh, living in Ukraine. Oh, this is the dynamic. Okay, uh, we have time for two more uh, <laughs> questions. So, brief, brief. I want you to answer your question because you have a question. <laughs> and I think you may be answering this as well. You are not happy with changes in electoral law. I think that to mobilize young people to get involved in politics, you should, like, we haven't done it in Poland, but should we introduce the majority system of, of elections, not proportional, but the party system that becomes uh, that every politician becomes a slave of the leader of the party? Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this change, you know nobody would, would like to, to get involved in political life. And if you, I know you have mixed system, but this 50% yeah. of proportional elections makes the district too big, and the whole campaign is happening, I think, on central level, on central media, central TV, mm -hmm. and that's why. You don't have individual leaders that are responsible to the people, and there is no subjectivity of political politicians in Ukraine. And if you change that, maybe, maybe not very in a very fast way, but in seconds time elections, or in, in not in, in one term, in four years, eight years, you would get real uh, democracy in Ukraine. Maybe. Uh, you know, there is a big discussion about that in Ukraine. And I may, may say that personally, uh, I'm not in favor of this majority, majority uh, system because uh, at, at the moment, this system is even more misused than the political uh, the system of political parties. So uh, I'm not a specialist in that field. But I would just look uh, into the, the old, good British system of uh, election, when there is one leader and there is political representation. The victory of that some, some personal leader means the victory of the party. But I don't know how it works. And, and, uh, so maybe you are right, but, but I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I grew up uh, Ukrainian American, uh, and we were always uh, yearning for Ukraine's independence. And of course, now it's happened. And I, I find it very interesting that the former president of Ukrainian Catholic University, uh, Father now Bishop Boris the was, was born in Syracuse, New York. The Ukrainian Catholic Bishop in London was born in Detroit. The minister of health in Ukraine now, grew up in Chicago. Uh, my son, a graduate of Notre Dame, uh, took part as an election observer in two of Ukraine's post-Maidan elections. And I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on uh, that dynamic of uh, the, the cross-Atlantic, and of course I'm thrilled that my alma mater uh, has such a close relationship with the Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, let me say in the following way. Uh, we would not have the Ukrainian Catholic University without uh, Bishop Boris Gudziak, who is a, a graduate of Harvard uh, University. Because this is both spiritual integrity, moral integrity, and knowledge how democracy works, how, how the, the proper uh, system works. So this is a combination of the two. I remember when, for the first time, he insisted that uh, our students cannot specify uh, cheat, cannot cheat. Well, it's just the normal habit of us. Our parents can. 
you punished my uh, daughter or my son, but it's normal. <laughs> so there was no concept of uh, academic honesty be before that. So he was, first of all, the main uh, concept drawer of, of, of the uh, of this new new kind of system. So we benefited a lot from Ukrainians who lived uh, in other countries, Ukrainian diaspora, who then bring some new ideas and new concepts. And I'm sorry I didn't answer your second question. Trump's <laughs> uh, uh, approach to international relations is totally different from the preceding one more uh, hostility, more uh, a harder line. What impact, of, uh, if any, is that going to have on the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship? At the beginning, well, first of all, let me say the, the following. I didn't come to the United States to critical, <laughs> to, crit, to, to be critical to your know, leadership. Uh, but if you ask me, then I may say that at the beginning, we were a little bit afraid of that close tie with Russia, with, with Putin. It was visible. It was very nervous for us because then uh, we, we were afraid of uh, Yalta point two. Uh, now we see that it, it is not probably the case. And first of all, because of the US Senate and uh, Congress. And this is very, very very pleasant moment for, for us. But we still, uh, we are more and more live in an up unpredictable world. We cannot, we, I don't know what to predict from Trump, from, uh, uh, I don't know, thanks God we don't have Marine Le Pen in, in France. But all these leaders, uh, who do not fit into the typical liberal mo modern uh, model of de democracy. So that's why living in unpredictable world means that we may expect anything. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what will be the future. But thank you at least that American society now is more and more aware that there is somebody in the Kremlin, the Kremlin that wants to destroy your country. Well, Miroslav, first of all, I want to assure you that at Notre Dame, um, we think it's, or we are not afraid to sit with our students. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the opportunity, and I know how much our students share in common with your students. So thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs>